Yeah. And uh, this is a perfect segue because another person who got up close and personal with uh, the Trump coalition this week was uh, Kevin D. Williamson of the National Review. Uh, do you have a Dracula music drop? <laughs> and, yeah, um, I'm just going to edit in some organ music. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, sorry, just another uh, segue uh, side. When I whenever I see Kevin D. Williamson, I always think of uh, General Jack D. Ripper from Doctor Strange Love. I think about him sucking on D's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this this piece got a lot of burn this week, uh, and it basically boils down to uh, Kevin Williamson wants poor white Americans to pull their damn pants up. Can I can I just I know we're gonna really tear into this, but uh, can I just say my favorite central conceit of Kevin Williamson's piece, where he just he shits all over like Appalachians and uh, poor white Midwesterners and uh, you know like the the American white under all of them. He goes from upstate New York, Appalachia, yeah, Texas, everywhere. yeah, all if there's if there's white trash somewhere, he's he's taking a big old shit on them. So I want to say my my favorite conceit of it is. That he's like, well, yeah, why don't you be more like me, a massive success? It's like, <laughs> we're going to fucking, like, the National Review is as much of a welfare institution as, like, any of these big things. Oh, are. my God. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you're not rich. rich. You're, not, you, you're fucking nobody. You're a fucking asshole who wears an opera cape. And like reviews movies for he was he he was he started out as as he started out as the theater critic for the National Review and now I always see him referred to as their roving correspondent. He's always referred to himself and 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 in in National Review's press as the roving correspondent because I guess he's the only one that actually like travels places to write about them. Well, I mean, they call him the roving correspondent because Peeping Tom. (laughs) (laughs) Kevin Williamson. If you guys haven't seen him, he's just, he looks like Fat Anton LaVey, or he looks like uh, – I called him Cold Stone Steve Austin. <laughs> uh, but he he's like – no one respects him. No one – not even like – even like John Bedoris, who's a fucking dumb oaf himself. He's like – just is like, <laughs> like – By the way – He has to be friends with this guy. And he looks like – he looks like he goes into Forever 21 with mirrors on his shoes. <laughs> But he, he's painting himself as like, oh, why can't they be more like me? This is a paragraph in the Kevin Williamson uh, article that probably uh, raised the most eyebrows. So I'm, I'm going to read from, from, from the D-man right now. Uh, quote, if you spend time in hard scrabble white upstate New York or eastern Kentucky or my own native West Texas, and you take an honest look at the welfare dependency, the drug and alcohol addiction, the family anarchy, wishes to say the whelping of human children with all the respect and wisdom of a stray dog. (laughs) You will come to an awful realization. It wasn't Beijing. It wasn't even Washington as bad as Washington can be. It wasn't immigrants from Mexico excessive and problematic as they also may be. It wasn't any of that. These people did it to themselves. So now I think like, it's, it shouldn't really surprise anyone that the National Review has turned on poor white people with this level of vehemence, but I guess it's just noteworthy because now Kev is finally talking about poor white people the way he talks about all black people, which is just to compare them well, to animals. Kev, I, um, we should get him on. We should get him on the show. Yeah, we need to talk to Kevin. I'm sure he'll be great. We need to talk about Kevin. We need to talk about Kevin to Kevin. Yeah, he yeah. is a thin-skinned bitch, which makes him like one of the best ones. Because like he's still mad at Matt Bruning like a year later for trolling. Yeah, Matt Bruning fucking ended him. <laughs> <laughs> like as soon as you're on on like you're being recorded for a uh, for a broadcast to talk about policy or whatever, and you out of nowhere bring up a a guy on Twitter who owned you, <laughs> you, you he's in your head for life. <laughs> Yeah, he closes when he's at like the hot topic that they only have in DC. That's for thirty-five to sixty-year-old conservative men. The, the big and tall hot topic. <laughs> he's he's like closing his eyes and he's seeing Matt Bruning's Abby and just remembering all the ironic retweets he got. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but um, I want to I want to rope back around to episode two. Because another thing that I, I had to clock this week uh, is uh, Kev Williamson is back at oh, Dracula. Oh, God. Dracula. Dracula Dra- has Fat risen Dracula from is in the house. 
fat Dracula has like risen from his grave. You know, at the end of episode two, like we ran a fucking wooden stake through his heart and we were like, oh, thank God we're safe. We murdered the fuck out of that bitch. Of course, you cannot kill what is already dead. It's like, you know, by halfway through the week, like his eyes opened in that coffin. What is dead can never die. It it was like it was like the end of Batman versus Superman. Like they buried (laughs) the the, 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 the levitating earth. No, uh, uh, Kev, Kev Dracula, Kev Drac is back at it again uh, this week with a, a piece in the National Review that he wrote that is like a big response to all the critics of uh, his let's kill the poor uh, or let's, you know, <laughs> let's evacuate the white working class from their hollers and haunts uh, piece that uh, quite, caused quite a bit of a stir and that we discussed at length in uh, episode two. Uh, it took him a long time to reply to it, but that's just because like, he's a serious guy. He's like, you know, not on the internet all the time, but you know, he takes, he, he likes to consider uh, his thoughts before he uh, writes them. And, uh, here are some of them. I'm quoting from him now. I don't give a, the furry crack of a rat's behind what the people at Breitbart think of anything. If indeed they can be said to think at all. Ooh, got him. Owned. Rap airhorn. I can't, he does. He does the same thing that people do when they're like writing angry letters to video game magazines, where they just they can't let anything go. It's like you pointed this out, where they're like, "I'll be brief here." Seventeen paragraphs later, they wrote, "If you can characterize the scribbling of noises as writing, yeah, just open every paragraph with not to belabor this point, if indeed a point is what we are discussing at all." Uh, to be brief here, because, you know, to even address this is not something that I would even deign to think of. But, you know, yeah, 10,000 words later, he, you know, gets to the uh, end of this piece. But um, uh, here, here, here's another one of the money quotes from this uh, Kevin Williamson piece, which, again, like I said, he is uh, he's sort of positioning as a big fuck you to all his critics like Joe Scarborough and, you know, among others who sort of took the piss out of him. And completely misunderstood his message about how we don't need to kill all the poor white people. We just need to, like, you know, uh, remove them from their homes. We just need a mass forcible uh, migration effort, sort of like when the Khmer Rouge would come yeah, into exactly. Phnom Penh and and kick everybody out. Uh, and but instead of shooting everybody who wore uh, spectacles the way they did in Cambodia, it would be executing everybody who was wearing a NASCAR shirt. Another person that let Kevin down this week was uh, Rush Limbaugh. And he just has one sentence. It's like it stands alone. It's like its own paragraph. He just says, I expected better of Rush. Uh, did you? Did why? You, why did you? <laughs> the Oxycontin <laughs> sex addict. And, well, that, and well, that's really funny fucking, because uh, buffet. Uh, one of the things that uh, Kev harped on in his first piece was about how all these poor white trash were uh, dope fiends. Yeah, and right, he and, fucking and lost his hearing from doing oxy. Uh, there's one. Uh, right. There's one other. There was one other piece that that Kevin did this week that I thought was hilarious. Though it was called "The Left Is Coming for You Next," and it was a. Uh, uh, it's about a. Uh, an attempts by uh, New York State to try to sue fossil fuel companies for uh, for basically contributing to global warming, and you know it's it's typical right wing hysterics about uh, you know the left's totalitarianism preventing you from having the, the suburban lifestyle that you want. But there's one line in it that I thought was hilarious. Uh, he's quoting an executive from an energy giant who says. We're an oil company. You can say almost anything about an oil company. There's no stories in which the oil company is the good guy. And then Kevin says, there is one, the one where you go to the 7-Eleven and fill up your miraculous machine with the miraculous energy source that would, within the recent history of the human species, have been indistinguishable from magic. And I just wanted to congratulate uh, Kevin. I just wanted to advanced. congratulate Kevin on becoming the conservative movement's Louis C.K., He's decided to take Louis C.K.'s classic bit about air travel and ex- and just extrapolate it into any kind of refutation of environmental. It's he's just decided to be like, what? It, uh, oil is dinosaur come, you fucking idiots. Where do you? That's a fucking miracle. How dare you question it? But I'm glad you brought up Black Lives Matter because there is one. I think this is maybe the best thing Kevin has ever written. This sentence is perfect. He says. Uh, again, sort of almost apropos of nothing. 
uh, quote, you know who could really help clarify this? Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is the magic line right here. Cosby's reputation today is somewhat diminished. <laughs> First of all, the funny Kevin, thing is that, the... that, that that happened, that exact same thing happened la- late last year with Rudy Giuliani. He was on Fox News or something and he said, you know, I understand that there's been some uh, – some controversy about him, but uh, I think that Bill Cosby still speaks the most uh, truthful thing. And I think it's time for us to really acknowledge the real victims of the Cosby sexual assault allegations, and that are conservatives who cannot think of a single other black person to quote to saying, pull up your pants. <laughs> well, they, I think they have Ben Carson now. Well, right? they, they apparently ben not. Ben Carson they won't, they ben. won't do it. They cannot yeah. even bring themselves to say anybody other than Bill Cosby, regardless of what he's accused of having done. Right. Ben, ben Carson also does not say pull up your pants. He doesn't say anything coherent. It's really not applicable to, to black people. Sorry. Being they're, 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 they're coaching him to try to say it. Like Kevin is wearing like all of his opera capes and he's like, just say it. And Ben Carson is like, I think the, the people can wear pants. <laughs> These I hands. Think, I, think, I think if you put your pants on a certain way, you should be expected to be treated another way. I just said, uh, Kevin, I would like to thank you for and all the other Draculas of this world. <laughs> I think that all the Draculas and Frankensteins could get together and say to people, well, what's so scary about us compared to things like ISIS? Uh, you know, if, if uh, you took all the trips that Kevin took to Thailand and you compare them with all the hauntings that he did in his castle, it still wouldn't be as many times as President Obama went golfing. I like to I like to sag my pants a bit because it's like a special treat you can do where you go to the bathroom and wow boom you don't have to pull your pants down that much but I think if a young man is trying to get a job he'd be best suited to not wear pants at all maybe a barrel of some type or a cloak but a cloak it was Jesus Christ himself was an amateur and Pontius Pilate was a professional and uh, I just want to thank Kevin for inviting me to his dungeon. <laughs> I, I, can't, I, can't even follow, I can't even follow it up. I think we're going to, as I previously mentioned, visit an old friend. Longtime fans of the show will remember our very second episode was entitled, We Need to Talk About Kevin. The first duck hunt. Yep. Yeah. And Kevin kind of made us. That was our first like successful episode was yeah. when we talked about Kevin, Kevin Dracula Williamson. And I think we're going to do it again now. We got we we still need to talk about Kevin because he's still at it. Look, and to put it gently, his views are not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope we don't get too naughty. Lord yeah. forgive him because Kevin's back on his shit. Yeah. Um. And and the reason we're bringing it up is that he's had a a banner week or a better couple of weeks just firing out uh, missives at the uh, the National Review. Uh, the first of which uh, is the one that I think got the most burn. And that was an article entitled I Am Cancer, which I got to say is uh, that's truth in advertising. He's been listening to us. Yeah. 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 I've been saying he's a tumor for a long this time is a, now. This is a both sides thing. I agree with that. And he is growing. Uh, that is true. Yeah. Like a yeah. tumor. Yeah. 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 That dude is getting, we were, uh, he's getting swole, man. Jesus. We were arguing before the show. Uh, someone said that it looks like he has opiate bloat, whereas I maintain that he just has an addiction to fudge. <laughs> he goes to that uh, mall fudge shop where they have to sing to you because he likes uh, servitude and that chocolatey treat. <laughs> he likes well, to humiliate teenagers. He's like a comic book villain where human misery makes him grow larger. Yeah. <laughs> he will eventually consume the entire planet. Now, we're referring to the fact that if you do a Google image search for Kevin D. Williamson or, or just even look at his, his author page in the National Review and like look at his little author photo, you will see like a, a gaunt, almost skeletor-like visage. But then if you look at any of his latest TV appearances, he looks like Steven Seagal, basically. He's yeah. got, he looks yeah. like a... Yes. He's Bald got the Seagal. goatee and everything. Yeah, he looks like if Steven Seagal just bicked his entire head and kept the Entenmann's Donut goatee, <laughs> it would look like Kevin D. Williamson does now. So there's something going on there. Um, Kevin is constantly listed uh, in the National Review as their roving correspondent. And, roving uh, correspondent just means a correspondent who happens to be a peeping Tom. <laughs> 
Well, as you said, I think he's been roving into Candyland, basically. Yep, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got lost somewhere around the uh, Hershey Highway. <laughs> in, the, in the Willy Wonka factory. He's been underneath that chocolate waterfall for he, the last he, month or he so. He went into the waterfall like Augustus Gloop, but instead of being sucked up and dying, he just f- drank it dry and was <laughs> like, pathetic. <laughs> when Kevin finally dies from all the fudge, uh, that's actually the first scene of Seven when Brad Pitt goes to the house and sees <laughs> gl- uh, the gluttony uh, victim. Well, I mean, it's fitting because he's a guy that basically blames basically any bad thing that happens to any individual as being in 100% entirely their fault. So, you know, when he loses a foot, we'll know what to think. So the I Am Cancer piece is the one that everyone shared the most. And the subhead is the view from eviction court. And this is, yeah, he's roving again. And he's writing these sort of uh, literary-like dispatches from his own life. What do you mean roving? That's just some shit he had to do. The rascal scootering correspondent. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, continuing on here. Why are you doing this to us? The woman's daughter demanded. Um, and then I want to just mention here that the, the rest of this graph, he puts all in italics because he's a good writer. This is, you know, yeah. what good prose stylists do. Why are you doing this to us? Because I am the bad thing that is just happening to you today. The unforeseeable event that has been hanging over you by a single hair of a horse's tail for a decade. The inevitable end of a terrible lamentation. He's like fucking Ned Beatty in Network right now. He's just ripping off movies at this point. Foolish mortals. I am the bad thing. <laughs> he remind No, he's the uh, Colonel Sanders guy from The Matrix. <laughs> the guy in the, yeah. the architect. The architect. The architect. Yeah. 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 Except, except he actually is eating KFC. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> Ergo Proctor. Um. Stop eating double downs. Where's Trinity? Yeah, no, what he says here is, uh, but people love their sad stories. They feel compelled to tell them. And, like, again, this is another, uh. this is another tick that you see in the National Review and other sort of highbrow conservative outlets is that they, they always think that, like, for instance, about the latest healthcare debacle, um, that, you know, the people's sort of instinctual moral revulsion at like the suffering that's going to be caused by it in their fellow human beings. If, if politicians bring that up or evoke that in any way, they always think that that's like some kind of cheat code, that it's not fair or something like that, that they're getting away with something by acknowledging the terrible human cult toll of their policies or just talking about anything in a way that doesn't make you seem like some sort of ghoul or undead. It's the impulse uh, from fifth grade where you want to be the future supervillain of the class. How did that happen? It must have begun with decisions he made as a child or as a very young man. A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to a good income and a nice house and a bass boat. Are the, are the uh, alphabet, the, those letters leading to each other, is that the progression of Kevin's diabetes? <laughs> <laughs> um... Uh, about that 20-week abortion bill. A note to House Republicans. This is the 20, 42nd anniversary of Roe v. Wade. I never need reminding of which anniversary it is. It's always the same as my age. I was one of those who entered the world through a pregnancy of the sort we call unplanned. Though I do not object to being, quote, the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design. I was born about three months, call it a trimester, before Roe. In my case, the result was an adoption. Mine wasn't, as it turns out, the sort of success story you'd put in a brochure. My adoptive parents were divorced only a few years later, and there was subsequently a great deal of unpleasantness in my home upon which I do not intend to dwell. Some had happier families, some far worse. Eventually, I discovered that I had certain talents, which friends encouraged and teachers helped me develop. I had to be... (laughs) I could float upside down. (laughs) It was invisible in mirrors. I had the uniquely American experience of playing high school football in West Texas for what was the longest uh, losing... Friday, fr- Friday Daywalker Lights. <laughs> More like Friday Night Frights. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Learned a trade at the mighty, mighty Daily Texan at the University of Texas, and then moved to India to apply it. I was editor-in-chief of a small newspaper before I was 30, and started a daily newspaper in Philadelphia a few years later. I failed at that, but it was tremendously fun. And on our better days, we put out a more interesting broadsheet than the Inquirer. I've published a few books, had a few rejected, walked in the foothills of the Himalayas, and driven a convertible through the Alps, gotten into bar fights, played box prelude as part of a classical guitar duet. I would. I work at the only magazine I've ever really wanted to work at, and Bill Buckley once asked me for a word he was unable to call up at the moment. There have been a few rough stretches, and some that have been nearly perfect. None of it 
was optional. I bet a puppet, a pauper, a poet, a pauper, a pauper, a king. Is it possible to give somebody like a 500th trimester mercy abortion <laughs> well, after not- that? That is the most depressing thing I have ever heard. Okay. Oh, yeah, you want to abort me? Guess what? Bill Buckley placed his lizard hand on my shoulder. <laughs> I got I got my book rejected. I've been in bar fights. I've had a little drink called tequila. I've driven a car. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I could go to the movies by myself like that. I climb the gentle foothills of the Himalayas. Yeah, like if you get off of the airport, off the airplane in Kathmandu, congratulations, you're in the foothills of the Himalayas. Uh, I've gotten into a hot tub without my T-shirt on. Uh, I think if you're, if you're a pro life position is you need to ban abortion or else Kevin Williamson will be aborted, you're fucking up. Because he's not really a sterling example of the people that you want to have have around. This this is great. I love the he takes it personally because he could have been aborted. Because it's like the guys who are like, yeah... Dude, don't insult the military. I actually almost signed up for the National Guard after 9-11. <laughs> that could have been me. This, yeah, but they act like he fucking crawled out of a dumpster behind a Planned no, listen, Parenthood listen after th- they, like, scraped him out. Listen to this. Here's the climax of the article. People like me, we unplanned, the millions of us, now live the first part of our lives outside the protection of the laws of these United States. Our, he's comparing himself to Dred Scott. Our lives and very often our deaths are instruments of the convenience of others. That was different in my case by a matter of a few months. It is impossible for me to know whether the woman who gave birth to me would have chosen abortion if there had been a more readily available alternative in 1972. I would not bet my life, neither the good nor bad parts of it, on her not choosing it. Well, Virgil, as you rightly pointed out, um, we're, in a, we're in a weird place now where um, genetic screening is able to tell earlier and earlier if your fetus will become a National Review columnist. And we're in danger of losing them, all of them. Ma'am, your child will be perfectly round. Uh, <laughs> two, two things. Ma'am, ma'am two things. Your, your child is already trapped in the uterine elevator. Ma'am, your, your child will, <laughs> will never be able to ride the New York City subway. <laughs> two things. One, he could have been aborted before Roe. Yeah. The idea that there were no abortions before Roe, fuck, you're a fucking idiot if you think that. People were having plenty of abortions. They were just unsafe and, and often dangerous for the mothers. They would and, actually throw the baseball crank at them. <laughs> That's why he's so against it. Uh, and two, anybody could have been a fucking abortion. This idea that only uh, only unwanted pregnant or, or only uh, 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 poor women or only people who, who, who go on to adopt their kids might have been. Plenty of people... Abort, plenty of women have abortions who are married, who have children already. It's a choice that ton, 30% of, by some estimations, of American women have made. Any of us could have been fucking aborted. The idea that he's some fucking special case, wait, wait, wait. Are that you he's saying, some escapee from Logan's Run, are fuck you, off. Are you saying we're also in the protected class of we possible are. abortion? Guys, victims. guys, oh we, my God. And we are, everyone in this room, we're all survivors. Any women listening right now, I just found out I survived a near-death experience as a child. <laughs> don't want to feel Please alone. Please protect me. I, right. want, I, I actually help send nudes. But like speaking of like the sort of the reaction to the the the, the hammed birder spectacle, right? Yeah. I just want to talk about uh, someone did check in on this, and I would like to share it now. Old friend of the show, and someone who is also not unfamiliar with having. I don't know, a sort of Orson Welles style <laughs> uh, appetites and physique. A gourmand. If a you gourmand, will. if you will. I'm talking, of course, about the swirl of a cape. Yeah. <laughs> the Paul Prudhomme. So, I'm talking about. Somebody put that uh, organ uh, blast in there. <laughs> I'm talking about Kevin D. Williamson, yeah. a.k.a. Uh, Fat Dracula. Kevin Heavy D. Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> We just need to clock how absolutely full of shit this guy is, because uh, here's his response to this. He says, on Monday, President Trump welcomed the Clemson Tigers, this year's college football champions, to the White House. With the government partially shut down, the usual White House hospitality was not on the table. And so the Trump team improved in a very Trump way with a buffet of fast food from McDonald's, Burger King and Domino's. The most normal thing about Donald J. Trump, (laughs) the most American thing, is probably his taste for fast food. The man likes his KFC. This scandalizes the sort of people who today belong to what in some quarters is still known as the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. I don't don't get that. Uh, Minnesota. Minnesota. Oh, okay. Rebecca Jennings, writing in Vox, sniffed that it was a strange choice, particularly for an event held in the 140-seat state dining room. Perhaps Bresco was all booked up. The usual progressive complaints were made. The fast food was disrespectful, classist, and heavens, racist. Jennings quotes a Trump critic arguing that a Big Mac served on a silver platter is probably the best metaphor for Trump's presidency I can think of. 
Somebody should tell him about that golden toilet up the street from Trump's place at the Guggenheim. The Clemson quarterback, for his part, judged the spread awesome. And what I love about this is what, 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 uh, what Stone, uh, Cold Stone Steve Austin <laughs> is, uh, is doing with this is like, he's like, oh, they're turning up their nose at the, the most Hardy, normal thing yeah. about Donald Trump is that he eats fast food every day. Wholesome food. But like Kevin D. Williamson is also perhaps best known for literally saying that like yeah. our white underclass who eats fast food every day should kill should themselves yeah. with a needle. Their feet fentanyl. should fall off from uh, diabetes. They should overdose from fent. They should just be bulldozed into open graves. Again, Carlo of Nosgard says people do not remember their own lives. <laughs> Oh wow. yeah, I can't wait for more of these nuggets. As you <laughs> oh, there are a lot of them. As you read that fucking. Do you want to hear about? Do you want to hear about Carl's New Year's Eve? I don't. Not, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, there was a big plot with him trying to secure beer. Oh, but yeah, like now it's the back and forth over like if you're making fun of this, like th this is again, if you make fun of anything Donald Trump does or any of the just absurd idiotic spectacle of him being president and like. Just really revealing to the world what America truly is. Exactly, because like that, that quote from that uh, that lib who says, "Oh, Mac, Big Mac on a silver planner." That's the defining image of the that defines the Trump person. No, Damn, that's dude, America. So, yeah, that yeah. is America. It's not just Trump. It is everything that was always here. He's just revealing it in the most heavy-handed mid ninety satire way and, possible. And, and, and you know, Matt and I were talking before we were recording, and I, you know, I've, I've always been flummoxed by the whole, you know, all right wing obsession with uh, culture in terms of Steve King and all this stuff about how well, we're going to bring people. Uh, we can't. We have to close the borders because if we bring people over here, they're going to have cultures that are going to add mix with our culture and fuck it up or whatever. And uh, I mean, the the two obvious counterpoints are uh, one. Uh, capitalism subsumes everything. So, you know, you could be from the most regressive culture and come to America, and within one generation, you're just another uh, uh, fucking psychotic who's, you know, trying to move up the <laughs> corporate ladder. And two, um, what culture are you trying to defend? This? Is this the apex of American culture? Well, this is, I think this points forward to what Matt was talking about, too, in terms of how this is going to be. Because he's going to get taken seriously like any other president and written about like every other president. And this is going to be what it is is it going to be he's the everyman president the guy that served mcdonald's to the football boys in the white house and that's yeah, like big boys which is you know again the way that like reagan still gets talked about as being like this guy that understood yeah. some innate yes. thing when really it was just that like everything in his head was falling away except for like inspirational speeches that he'd given in movies about like driving safely or whatever <laughs> from like you know, just, for the gipper yeah but this is there's something about the the idea also of like at this moment of defending this idea of a culture that it is also at the moment of like peak abasement yeah. of itself that like there's yeah. a video uh, that is not the one that we watched that a coworker sent me um it was from outside the white house it was one of those like trumpy scrums where for once there wasn't a helicopter like 10 feet away <laughs> Screaming Just, yeah him. right so in this case he's he's saying the same things he said inside there where he's like you know a ton of burgers like they're pouring in more and more whatever and then as he leaves, the reporters are yelling questions at him. And one person is like, should Steve King resign? Should Steve King resign, sir? And then like oh, that person gets shouted down, not by Trump, but by the other reporters being like, do you have honey mustard, sir? <laughs> <laughs> like, do you have so how much? sauce, sir? Do you yeah. have the epic <laughs> Szechuan sauce? And that video is like, cause you're right that like that's a, a strong Kubrick vibe, the interiors. It's very ornate. It's very well lit. Yes. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Whereas the one outside looks like fucking Inland Empire. Like, it's like weird late Lynch. Like, the audio's not synced. It's like super bright spotlight on him. And he's all clammy and like just whatever. It, that one is, I'll share it. So yeah. I mean, put it, it on is, this if you want. It but. is like perfect though, because for the people that want to feel their only desires for everything to feel normal again and they want Trump out of there, the one of the key features of everything feeling normal again will be in a decade or possibly less, we will fondly remember the things Trump did. No one's going to remember the shutdown. Very few people will remember the doc will remember DACA or any of the border violence or anything like that. It will just be like, oh, you know, I didn't agree with it, but he was fun. Sometime. They continue yeah. travel ban. Yeah, yeah. And, just, and, and you know what? Give majority credit, Muslim he, countries. He secured a f ex the f he secured the existence of our people and a future for purple grimaces. <laughs> yeah, I mean when when, that's when, when, no, when, that's when Keemstar is president. And the State of the Union is that video. It just, Lil Xan comes over, and they just sit around and talk. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, it's just, shit is just so not By made. the way, this is that's, a... That's what it's going to be. This is a fucking publicity stunt in the middle of the longest government shutdown in history. 
where uh, the fucking TSA workers who are already fucking underpaid and don't really have a lot to do are calling in sick where airports are uh, steadily shutting down right now and where people are just being able to get shit through fucking uh, airport security, guns, whatever the fuck you want, drugs, go nuts. If you want to fucking bribe a TSA agent right now, here's the time to fucking do it. I mean, I'm, I don't sorry. even have a flight coming up. I just like to do that. Yeah, seriously, I might try to just like move some weight. Just yeah, to put on, <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> but just back to back to Kevin D. Williamson and how utterly full of shit he is. Because like, first of all, he has the same body type as Trump. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, he, yeah. Big hot. wide Perfect boy. Yeah. Big wide boy. That's another guy who might swap out a suit jacket for an overcoat just for oh, like yeah, a sassy look. Yeah, he just he wears capes just because it's like form fitting. <laughs> but like, okay, he's saying like this is actually the most normal thing about Donald Trump, his love of fast food. And it's like in any other context, in any of other of his essays that yep. people have lauded him for to be like, hey, you know, you may not agree with the guy, but man, oh man, can he write? The amount of like contempt and just visceral hatred he has for any person who would eat fast food yeah. every day he would say so apparent he would say if if, if anyone uh had some sob story about losing a job or having an addiction or having diabetes uh, or, 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 or diabetes or, or struggling to make a payment he'd say and yet you have money every day to stuff your face with this horrible food that doesn't even nourish you and makes you sick and you're too stupid not to do it that's what he would say to anybody who uh who didn't have uh Trump's just golden underwear to protect him from any consequences for his actions. I think the difference is if you have enough money to buy whatever food you want, but you choose to do this, then Kevin Williamson's like terrific. That's the thing. He zigs right. where they He's, zag. It's that Burkean thing where where anything that rich people do by virtue of the fact that they have so many resources is some sort of art project. And so this rich guy just eating garbage is is almost a postmodern commentary, and therefore to be impressive as yeah, well, that's some like disgusting slug just stuffing his face. That's the challenge with with Trump in general. The idea of it being like, if you criticize it as being like, well, this is just really fucking dumb as hell, and he's an oaf, then you're not only are you like part of the reason why he won and all exactly, the other sort yes, of troll yeah. shit that they throw back. It's also like. If you just continue to assess this as exactly what it appears to be, which is all it is, because Trump himself is not a master of anything except for like walking around with toilet paper stuck to his shoe or whatever. <laughs> like he's not deft, you know, but this is it, to keep writing about it as what it is, which is just like this big weirdo fucking up and being strange. Then like that is one note. It's a challenge in writing about him, but certainly it's not something that Williamson can't even admit of that. Well, I mean, like to what Williamson is what Williamson is responding to, like the Vox thing, we're like, you know, a Big Mac on a silver tray. Like, I think that's a metaphor for Donald Trump's America. Again, as you said, Matt, that there's no metaphor no. there. Like, the, the, like a metaphor replies, like implies, like it, like it's standing in for something right. else. So there's a degree of remove. It's like no, that like there, there is no no. Like that's just it. So to, to round out today, I have a I have a reading series to cap off this episode that is a a return to form for us. Uh, this is a this is a. Uh, this this guy lives in the Chapo Pantheon. He was featured in a reading series on our second ever episode, the episode where things really took off, and we were like, "Hey, we got we got a little something here. We got a little lightning in the bottle." I'm talking, of course, about as Felix referred to him on that episode, Cold Stone Steve Austin. I'm speaking, of course, about <laughs> the National Review's roving correspondent of Kevin Kevin D. Williamson. Roving correspondents. Such a good name. Because it is it's such like, a good name. It, it's like peeping Tom correspondent. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. it's like roving correspondent is the title they give you when like you you have no area of expertise or knowledge in any given subject, but uh. you but you certainly like to stalk uh, suburban subdivisions, sort of glowering in people's uh, front yards. And this is exactly what this article is all about. This yeah. is an article so pointless and pretentious that it could only come from a roving correspondent. He establishes that he lives in some kind of. A uh, rich suburban uh, cul-de-sac in which people there's golf courses nearby and people drive Audis, so it's like fairly well off. And then he he tags himself as being a member of the bourgeoisie, the sort of the money lifting class. But then he says, oh, you know, just so you know, in addition to loud noises um, frightening me, I also very much dislike the smell of gasoline. But then he makes sure parenthetically to let you know that he also drives a motorcycle, but it's a quiet and clean one. Uh, yeah, this is um, this is <laughs> hey, is it Williams. is it. Is it like, does he drive on it with his twin on weekends? <laughs> <laughs> is he allowed to go by himself? Uh, he goes here, my neighbors look at me a little funny, possibly because I'm the only man on the block who cuts his own grass. 
Uh, Kevin, they're and I do it while wearing a cape. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, Kevin, they're looking at you funny because of the way you look and dress, not because that you're pushing a lawnmower <laughs> up and down your fucking uh, garden. Uh, it goes on here. There's a lot of stuff about immigrants, and like, there's really no actual like political immigrants? clean venting here. He's just he talks about how um, one of the he just talks about how he spends a lot of time around immigrants, and he likes immigrants because they like America. And even though his family are of old stock, he feels sort of at home among immigrants. Then he goes back to talking about leaf blowers and America being a sort of convenient place to live. And it's a, the leaf blower is a pretty good emblem for them and that it effectuates our inexplicable national contempt for public spaces. Leaf blower man is king of his castle. If he blows his yard waste into the street, that is someone else's problem. Not my problem. Translate that into Latin and inscribe it on the capital rotunda. The leaf blower man blows his trash. Rotunda, is that what they call you? <laughs> I don't know. I kind of like it now. If, it, I'm imagining, like, uh, what's his name? Martin from The Simpsons growing up. Wait a minute. Is he, is, <laughs> no, he, is, he, yeah. is he unhappy about the fact that in America we tend to public ex, uh, uh, take externalities from our actions and put them on the public and have that be unpriced? Well, uh, well, and unconsidered you, is he is he unhappy about that because well, Matt, that seems like the defining characteristic of American capitalism. Matt, you, I mean the, the the subhead to this piece was leaf blower man and the contempt American contempt for public spaces. I think if you if you'll remember back the last Kevin D Williamson re- reading series I did on this show was his article about how we should bring back public executions. So I think oh, yeah. that's he, he wants to, he wants to hear the snap of someone's neck or the fucking thud of a head on a tumbrel. Uh, instead oh, of hearing so a, the, a, a leaf blower whine, so this guy's like, "Hey, morning. are you guys? Am I am I alone here, or would you rather see a gallows than a <laughs> than a leaf blower in public?" Oh, I am alone. Oh, you're calling the police. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, Never mind. Is, yeah, I I think Adam gets to the the heart of it here. Is that like, yeah, like who is this for? Wait, so what? What's his point? He was there is there is no point doing There's yard no work. point. Yeah. No there's, point there's to any no of this. Point to this. Okay, I'm, I'll, just, I'll just finish. Up and, I'll finish reading the last two paragraphs, and you'll, you you can you tell me what you think you can wring out of this. The smell of gasoline might be understood as the bouquet of our contempt for public places. Where do the homeless congregate? Under freeway overpasses, outside of gas stations, begging drivers waiting in lines at drive-through windows, or jammed up at busy intersections. Tattered infantry to our high-riding armored cavalry. Half of the commercial and hospitality spaces in our country, from 7-Eleven to Starbucks, serve as part-time homeless shelters and mental wards for people blown out onto the street like, I won't belabor the metaphor, I'll let Dante do it for me. Standing outside the Mm. gates of hell, the great pilgrim sees the souls of the dead making their final procession. As the leaves fall away in autumn, one after another, till the bough sees all its spoils upon the ground... So there the evil seed of Adam, one by one, cast themselves from that shore at signals, like a bird at its call. So, yeah, he's, um, he says, I won't belabor the metaphor. I'll just share a quote from Dante with you. <laughs> so you just, <laughs> just stretch out this leaf thing I'm talking about just a little longer. And then he just says at the end, when life got back to normal for a little bit, I had accumulated things to do, some errands to run, and I started going back to the gym. I was so busy that I neglected my backyard for a few weeks. I was shocked by how quickly the weeds take over once again if you let them. I think he's trying, like he's he's aiming at this to be some sort of, I don't know, bemused threnody for uh, American culture or some some element of our character. But it is just him just farting into his computer. I would love to see him like try out this his his leaf blower bit. And just bomb at a Trump rally. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys hate leaf blowers? Fuck you! I love my fucking leaf blower. Mm-hmm. I burn all fucking day. Fuck! I'll kill you. It's yeah. just like he he starts talking, and he's like, you know, if I if if I may belabor the metaphor a bit further, I believe William Wordsworth once said, and then you just you're like, just just a fucking like a wall of leaf blow, just leaves just get blown straight at him as everyone in the front row just unholsters a fucking blower and blasts it right. In his fucking dumb yeah, bad then, face. then then Trump gets up there and he's like, "Fabric softener doesn't make things soft enough anymore." And everyone's just like, "You <laughs> fucking love you, sir." <laughs> I'm imagining modding my leaf blower to roll coal to take it to the Trump rally. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, you like- know, uh, as Heinrich Heine wrote in 19, 1821. Where they burn leaves, they will in the end burn human beings too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 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 